Here with us now is Chris Novak, the Director of Cyber Threat and Intelligence at Verizon. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Chris, I mean, ransomware is in the news seemingly every single day nowadays for the public sector. I mean, what, when you're talking to folks in, in government or, or higher ed, I mean, how are you advising them on their threat intelligence journey and you know, where should they get started? Sure. Yeah. No, and, and I'm glad you said it's a journey because that's one of the things that I always comment on as it relates to whether it be ransomware or just cybersecurity in general is that there's really kind of a journey or a spectrum to it in terms of everybody is at a different place. Everybody has a different goal of where it is they're trying to go to or get to ultimately. Um, and then obviously the other thing I, I often say is that it's it's kind of funny in the sense that it's a journey that really kind of never ends. Um, and, and I don't mean that in an ominous way, uh, but more of, you know, the, the landscape is constantly changing. So if your goal is to get to, you know, this level of security or that level of security, that may be great for today. But tomorrow, next week, next year, the threat landscape changes. And so obviously you need to evolve with that. So, you know, when I'm talking to organizations as it relates to, you know, what it is that they're doing for ransomware, a key piece of that is understanding what type of ransomware are they preparing for and how plugged in are they to understanding the way that that has changed over the years, right? The, the early days of ransomware we saw was really just about locking up your system. And now there's been multiple evolutions of that ransomware over time. You know, it used to be you could crack it. Now it's it's fairly robust. And, and we're also seeing situations where the ransomware actually leads to things like data exfiltration or, or publication of your sensitive data. So kind of being prepared for and having playbooks for that entire um, collection of, of different types of ransomwares that you may encounter is obviously very important. And when it comes to the, the threat intelligence piece of, of this puzzle, I mean, how should these leaders, again, government and higher education, how should they prioritize intelligence uh, over the other pressing focus areas on a given day? Sure. Yeah, great question. And so, I mean, one of the first things I always tell everybody is before you do anything else, make sure you have the fundamentals, the foundational building blocks of cybersecurity in place. If you try to skip over that to do more sophisticated or fancier things, you're gonna end up getting beaten up by a threat actor who just comes right in the front door because you left it unlocked and wide open. Uh, but assuming you've got the, the fundamentals and the foundational items in place, threat intelligence is probably one of the next key things that I'm usually advising organizations on what they should be doing. And the importance of it is situational awareness. You know, Going back to the earlier comments around ransomware, the more you can know about what's happening, the better you can prepare your defenses and your protection, your mitigation, or you know, if it gets past that, your ability to then detect respond and mitigate that. Threat intelligence plays a critical role in having that information readily at your fingertips. You know, we talk about what's happening on the geopolitical stage right now between Russia and Ukraine. Everybody's asking me what it is that we're seeing. You know, you know I often say that, you know, when you look at Verizon, we own and operate a big portion of the internet backbone, right? We, we typically say that that is the battleground in which these cyber attacks take place, whether it's ransomware or anything else. You know, it could be disruption of an OT environment and an energy utility grid. Having that tie in from a threat intelligence perspective, you know, what I say is typically you wanna kind of have it be like machine to machine type of communication, a feed, if you will, where then you can actually understand what's happening real time as we or others see it, right? So I'll give you a, for example, when my team goes out and we do a breach investigation, whether it's, you know, related to something in the, the geopolitical landscape, or maybe it's something, you know, more mundane. The moment we see something that a threat actor has done, the moment we've seen a piece of malware, the, the IOCs or the indicators of compromise, the TTPs, all of that goes into our intelligence feed. And the very same feed that we use to protect Verizon and all of our assets also then goes into that feed that we then look to stream out to customers so that they can then have that situational awareness and immediately detect on that, right? So if, if we see that IOC, it goes out in our feed, it goes into your system, you can then see, hey, wait a minute, someone is knocking on our door with this piece of malicious malware. The fact that we know it means we can block it before it has an opportunity to execute. And you know, if it's ransomware, you know, prevent the potential for it encrypting our systems. And I mean, another another big piece of, of this puzzle really is, is on the assessments piece, right? Assessing what's going on at any given moment, assessing what happened uh, at any given moment. So how do you see these these leaders uh, that we're talking about really approaching assessments on, on that, that journey uh, that we're talking about? 
Sure. Yeah. So when I look at assessments, there's a variety of different ways in which organizations can tackle that. The one thing that I typically start with is, you know, have you done something like a a basic cyber risk assessment, you know, something that gauges your maturity against, say, a benchmark standard or framework. Then the next thing, especially with what's going on in the world today, I'm encouraging everybody to look at what they're doing around things like penetration testing. You know, those types of assessments are critically important. At the end of the day, you know, if you look back at things like our data breach investigations report, you know, we point out that a lot of the attacks start with something opportunistic. They start with something generally easy to exploit. Now, that's not necessarily always the things that make for great TV and movies, but the fact of the matter is it's where we see the bulk of these activities starting. And so what I encourage organizations to do is get out there, do that penetration testing on a regular basis, because if you can find where those opportunistic exploits or vulnerabilities may exist at your perimeter or in your, in your environment, it increases the likelihood that you can address them and mitigate them before they actually can become something that a threat actor can exploit. And, and you can avoid having to deal with, say, the incident response and the remediation altogether. So when we're talking about, you know, we're talking about this, uh, the threat intelligence journey or the, the cyber maturity journey, I mean, what are some of the other big pieces in your mind that say I'm a, a CISO of a, you know, a county or a city or, or maybe even with one with a, a smaller team, um, you know, what are some of the other big pieces of that cyber maturity puzzle that, that I might be missing that I need to work on right now? Sure. So I would point out two things. One is, and this is kind of a, a soapbox item for me, and it has been for decades, and that is understanding your asset inventory. It is probably one of the most boring and mundane tasks in cybersecurity, um, but you would be shocked how often we go in and we do an incident response engagement. We help an organization try to figure out what has happened. And usually the biggest puzzle piece is not necessarily always figuring out what the threat actor did, but actually sometimes it's trying to figure out what the victim's environment actually looks like. Because if we're trying to figure out what they touched, how they manipulated it, what they stole, you need to have a really good starting point, you know, a, a blueprint of that environment to work off of. And a lot of times we find organizations struggle to have a really good asset inventory. And so if you don't know what assets you have, you struggle to then ensure that you've got security wrapped around them. You struggle to ensure that you're monitoring, monitoring them appropriately. And then obviously if you need to do incident response, it's important to understand where those assets are and what role they play. So that's one. And then the other piece would be incident response. A lot of organizations still today look at incident response as something that, hey, when something happens, I will find someone to help me, or I've got a, a great incident response team. What I always tell everybody is, look, train your people to be the best they possibly can be. Get them all the resources, technology, and tools you can possibly you know, afford um, in order to make that successful but then also have a backup or even a secondary backup to be able to say, look, if something happens, if this incident grows to a level beyond what we can handle, or maybe we get faced with multiple incidents at the same time, that also happens, it may exceed the capacity of what your team can handle. Having a secondary or a tertiary organization on retainer to be able to quickly drop in the moment you have that need, that can go a long way. I find a lot of organizations also struggle with, you know, in today's day and age, the cyber talent pool is incredibly tight. It's incredibly hard to find people and keep people. And then you still have to go through all the motions of, you know, training them and hopefully retaining them. So, you know, having that, that secondary and tertiary backup goes a long way in terms of peace of mind and knowing that, you know, when something happens, you, you've got people you can call on that know the environment and can help you respond. Let's stay on the thread of incident response for a second, because I think some of the points you're making are super interesting. I mean, if if leaders embrace the philosophy that you're talking about of, of really including incident response in that strategic planning, in that in that um, that strategy for 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 you know, response, uh, you know, what does that approach mean? for them and for their cyber operations long-term? Yeah, so I mean, ultimately it means you've got tighter control of that incident landscape end to end, right? So from the moment you detect something to the moment you are doing response and hopefully remediation and recovery, you can kind of tie all those linkages together. You know, one of the things that, that we frequently encourage organizations to do and participate in a lot ourselves is things like breach simulations and tabletop exercises, where it allows you to actually test a lot of what it is that you're team might face in the course of an incident. So, you know, if you look at it, you know, from the technical level where maybe you'd say, look, if a ransomware event happened, 
what would what playbook would you follow and what steps would you execute and let's go through those motions right let's actually exercise that and see how it fares and then all of that goes on to an executive level simulation or or tabletop if you will where you can say look the technical folks they know the buttons to press the steps to follow the systems to rebuild or however it is they might approach that but are the executives plugged in and aware of what their roles may need to be because a lot of times it's not always the difficult technical task of install this software, click this button or run that script. Sometimes the biggest and most difficult thing is we need to take something offline or we need to make a public statement or we need to adversely impact some part of our operations. And that may not be a hard technical button to click, if you will. It may be a very difficult executive decision to make. And there could be, you know, ongoing long term or collateral damage implications of that decision. And it's important that the executives are read into that playbook and that simulation or those exercises so that they're not surprised with having to make a big decision like that. And typically, you know, we talked about ransomware earlier the timeline in which those attacks take place are very fast. You know, typically you're looking at infection to ransomware demand to possibly system wiping. You know, maybe you're looking at 48 hours, 72 hours. So if you hit up the executive team with having to make a, a critical decision about your ongoing operations and you tell them, hey, this came in Friday night, we need to have an answer on what we're doing, yay or nay, by Sunday morning, that may not necessarily give them a lot of time, especially if it's not a circumstance that they've been prepared for. Chris, so many more directions we can go with this, but that's all the time we have for now. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Jake. And to the audience, stay tuned for more.